you're good to go. All right, thank you so much everyone for joining us today for Earth Day Every Day. My name is Vanessa, I'm with the Dallas Public Library and we're so thankful for the um, Dallas Environmental Quality and Sustainability <laughs> Department for putting on these programs um, here on Zoom. Uh, just some housekeeping for today. Okay, for Earth Day um, Day, my name is Vanessa, I'm with the Dallas Public oh, no. Library. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I was getting a little bit of feedback there. I apologize. Um, so just so you know, you will be muted for the uh, program, but if you have any questions for the presenter, um, you can put those in the chat and we'll get to those as um, we're able to. And also um, this program is being recorded, so you had to accept an agreement when you first joined. And if you don't want to appear, you can just turn off your camera um, if you would like. Uh, and these recordings will be available um, on the library's YouTube page. It's being live streamed on YouTube right now. Um, so you can always watch it after the program um, as well or share it with your friends if they weren't able to make it. All right, um, and now I'm gonna let, uh, introduce Helen with the Dallas Environmental Quality Sustainability Department to talk a little bit about what she does and to introduce our wonderful presenter for today. Thank you so much, Helen. Thank you, Vanessa. And just like she said, I am Helen Dulac. I'm with Dallas Environmental Quality and Sustainability and we are beyond excited to be partnering with the Dallas Public Library on this series on Thursdays called Earth Day Every Day. I'm just gonna give you a little brief uh, history about our department because you might not be familiar with us. So we were actually formed in 2004, but back then we were called the Office of Environmental Quality. We worked really hard for four years to help Dallas become the first city in the United States to achieve a special uh, environmental certification called ISO 14001. Uh, this is pretty common in different uh, large manufacturers and different kinds of uh, factories and companies. And this is a way to still deliver service and products with uh, less of an impact on the environment. So that's what the city of Dallas did. We looked at how we could still deliver service and decrease the impact on the environment. So we looked at the vehicles we use all the way to the paper we put in our coffee machine and we made a lot of different changes. We are audited every year to keep this certification and we're really excited that we still have it. Now, the other thing to note about this is we're talking about Dallas, Texas was the first city to do this. It wasn't a city in California. It wasn't a city in Colorado. It wasn't Austin, it was Dallas. So we do have a history of being green and we hope just to go greener with your help. So let's fast forward 10 years where a lot of changes happened to this department. There was a restructuring in the city and OEQ absorbed some other environmental operations and programs and we doubled in size. And to reflect that change, we changed our name. And that's when we became Environmental Quality and Sustainability. Uh, with that merger, also created a combined outreach and engagement team that I'm a proud member of. And the following year, in 2019, Mayor Eric Johnson created a committee of Dallas City Council that's focused just on the environment. It's called the Environment and Sustainability Committee. They meet the first Monday of every month at 9 a.m. You can watch those meetings live. And it's a great way to keep your finger on the green pulse of the city and learn about all sorts of different uh, green initiatives and pilot programs that the city is developing or launching. Uh, now, if you have heard of this department, it's probably because on May 27th of 2020, the city council passed our comprehensive environmental and climate action plan known as CCAP. So we're one of the few inland cities that has a climate plan. Dallas recognizes climate change and wants to mitigate it. So you can see all 250 pages of this plan at dallasclimateaction.com. And it is a roadmap for the next 30 years on how we're going to improve the quality of life for everybody in Dallas and fight climate change. And as the city does different things, you're gonna see that they align with this plan, including this whole series of presentations. So I mentioned that this department doubled in size. Well, those groups in green are the ones that just uh, joined us in 2018. I'm gonna talk about one of those just briefly, and that is stormwater. So last night we had some big storms that came through the area and not all of that water was absorbed into the ground. Some of that water ran off. So that is known as stormwater or urban runoff. So anytime the water goes across your property, across your lawn, down your driveway, into the street, that's stormwater. So the stormwater then travels down the gutter all the way to that big drain at the end of the street. And that big drain is called a storm drain inlet. And it's there for one reason, that's to keep the streets from flooding. So all of that rainwater, and also it, it also can be stuff like snow melt, which we've experienced. It could also be water from a hose. Anytime that water goes into a storm drain, it goes directly into a creek or stream, and then it goes into one of our beautiful lakes or the Trinity River. And it's not clean and it's not treated. So if it picks up any pollution along the way, whether it's litter, uh, bacteria that's in pet waste that wasn't picked up, uh, excess chemicals that someone put on their lawn, or uh, grass clippings or leaves that got blown into the street, or even 
fluids that leaked out of vehicles. That's how pollution gets into our lakes and into the Trinity River. And if you think about it, the Trinity is a river, so it flows somewhere. It actually flows 500 more miles all the way to the Gulf of Mexico. So there's a chance that pollution from our homes, from our neighborhoods, from our city, end up with the dolphins in the Gulf of Mexico. So please just be mindful about what you're doing outside. Pick up that pet waste. Don't blow your leaves and grass clippings into the street. Get those leaky vehicles fixed. And those small actions will help protect our water and the water for many others. So I mentioned uh, the outreach and engagement team that I'm a member of. Well, we want to empower Dallas to save the earth. So how do we do that? Well, we do it by virtual presentations like this and in person as things start opening up. If you're in Dallas and maybe you you're, belong to an HOA or you're in some sort of civic, civic club or organization, we can present to your group for free virtually. Uh, we also have a lot of materials for students anywhere from K to college. And if you have some sort of virtual seminar, activity or event, or as I said, as we're opening up, you have a drive through event, we can participate in those too. Uh, now, we also host some of our own events, uh, such as the upcoming Climate Change Symposium that's going to be in early April. It's going to be free and open to the public and it is virtual this year. And also in the fall, we're going to have a, our, uh, I think it's our 26th or 27th annual WaterWise Landscape Tour. And, uh, and so those are some really neat things to be on the lookout for. Now, if you do invite us to participate in your event, what do we talk about? Well, we can talk about environmental topics from A to Z, all the way from air quality to zero waste. So if you want to invite us, how do you do that? Well, you visit our website, greendallas.net, fill out the event request form, and, uh, and someone will be in touch with you about that. And of course, follow us on social media. We are Green Dallas TX on Facebook, and we are at Green Dallas on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, you can learn about uh, up upcoming programs in our Earth Day Everyday series, plus with our Grow With Us series, and find out about all sorts of other things that are happening uh, in our city. And um, with that, I'm going to introduce our speaker. So uh, if you want to start sharing your screen, please do. We are going to have a time for questions and answers. The uh, presentation is broken up into four parts. So there will be a pause at the end of each part where, where we will address your questions. So please add your questions into the chat and we will get those read out to our presenter. And speaking of our presenter, we are so excited to have Annika Gasnick. Uh, she is the Sustainability and Impact Manager at Hive Brands. She's worked across multiple parts of the food industry as a researcher, a producer and processor and in the grocery retail. Hive is the sustainable marketplace where every purchase makes a positive impact. Their mission is to help shoppers everywhere spend their dollars on products that do good in the world. Hive is committed to doing better and they're proud to partner with small and independent brands who've shared that mission from the very start. So welcome, Annika. Thank you so much, Helen. We are so thrilled to be a part of this presentation with the, the city of Dallas and the Dallas Public Library. Um, as Helen said, I work for a company called Hive Brands. Uh, it's an online market, marketplace focused on um, sustainable and ethically produced grocery and personal care items. Um, today, we're going to be talking about sustainability in food systems. So Helen just gave a wonderful, wonderful presentation on uh, sustainability in public infrastructure. Um, but we'll be talking about some of the things that consumers can do when they go grocery shopping in store online to choose more sustainable options uh, for your food. So the presentation will cover four different areas. The first will be uh, looking at some of the certifications and why certifications are important, but why they're not uh, the end all be all of sustainability. Next, we'll cover responsible sourcing of ingredients, some common issues in supply chains around the world. Thirdly, we'll be covering uh, carbon sequestration and the massive push towards becoming more carbon neutral across the board in businesses um, and also as an individual. And then lastly, we will touch on packaging and recycling. Um, and uh, then Helen will follow up with some tips for recycling in the city of Dallas. So to start, as a consumer, sometimes it can feel incredibly overwhelming to know what is truly sustainable, 
when you're looking at all of the amazing products in the grocery store. Um, one of the greatest tools that you can use are certifications. Uh, they are absolutely wonderful. They can tell you a lot about how the food was produced, um, how the producers were paid with things like fair trade, uh, what is in the food, if it's genetically modified or not. Um, so certifications can tell you many things and they're absolutely wonderful tools that we, we highly recommend. However, uh, they are not everything. And so we just wanted to briefly touch on some of the reasons why um, certifications are important, but it's important to also just pay attention to uh, companies as a whole. When you go to the farmer's market, you'll often find that a lot of the, the produce may not be certified USDA organic. Uh, this is because the cost for certifications can be really cost prohibitive for a lot of smaller producers. So it's always important to ask farmers or ask smaller producers how they go grow their crops. Are they using pesticides? Um, if they're certified, great, but many of them even go beyond the requirements for certifications. And so you'll find a lot of smaller farmers, they in fact don't use any pesticides at all, organic or not. Uh, one of the second reasons why certifications aren't everything is comprehensiveness. So when you have an international certifying body, um, there's a lot of inputs that go into that. And so what you come out with with a certification is often what can be known as a, like a minimal, minimum acceptable allowance for that issue. So for example, for fair trade, there has been occasionally criticism that fair trade doesn't go far enough. And so of course we would love for every producers to have living wages, but with the way that the international certification is set up at this time, um, fair trade certifications have determined that what they're paying is much better than an uncertified product, um, but it is not necessarily the ideal. And so a lot of times companies in lieu of getting a certification like fair trade will actually uh, go above and beyond to pay their producers even higher than, than a living wage or the minimum uh, wage for fair trade. Lastly, certifications and all the documentation that goes along with them is often really difficult for producers around the world to conduct. Um, a lot of times when we think of agriculture, we think of it in the US system where you know, it's really easy to access computers and to submit all of your paperwork. But if you're thinking of you know, a really small family coconut farm in Southeast Asia, it's not always possible to complete all of the paperwork necessary um, and all of the audits in a timely manner uh, to get that certification. So, what I just wanted to, what I want to make clear is that certifications are great tools, but um, if something does not have a certification, it does not mean that it does not meet those standards. And it's always important to look into uh, the supply chain further and, and just ask the company how their food is produced. Organic certification tends to be the most well-known. So I just wanted to show how uh, certifications can vary even within, you know, one certification such as USDA organic. If you see the USDA organic seal on a product, that means that at least 95% of the ingredients are organic, which is fantastic. If you see the statement 100% organic, that means that every single ingredient in there was organic, non-GMO. I also wanted to point out that products can say made with organic ingredients, which is also fantastic because that means at least 70% of the ingredients are certified, but they're not allowed to carry that seal. So just because you don't see the seal doesn't mean that the majority of products don't have organic ingredients in there. And uh, I just wanted to also point out that many of you have probably seen non-GMO certifications. When you see the organic seal, that automatically means that the crops are non-GMO because non-GMO crops are not allowed in organic agriculture. So if you see both, great, but if you see the organic seal, you also know that that product is not genetically modified. So once again, when it comes to certifications, they're absolutely fantastic and we definitely recommend that you look for them. Um, but the biggest thing is, is really learning how the products that you love and are buying are produced and, and making sure those companies are following uh, great sourcing principles. They're, they're paying their laborers fairly. Um, 
they're purchasing products that are produced in environmentally friendly ways. Um, so by being a more conscientious consumer and, and really trying to get to know these things, uh, we hopefully will push the food industry in a more positive direction. And a little plug for Hive here. Um, that's one of the things that we do at Hive. We pre-vet all of the products that we bring into our door um, so that you as a consumer can rest assured that we've asked all these questions to brands and um, we are presenting you with brands that we think are incredibly responsible food producers. Now to get to some of the heavier things, uh, a few, there's a few common issues in the food industry. One of the biggest ones and one of the most important when it comes to climate change is deforestation. So deforestation is primarily caused unfortunately by agriculture. Uh, as you can see from this map, um, the lighter green are the areas where there were forests at the beginning of uh, humans use of agriculture and then the forests that are remaining today. So you can see the concentration of the forest remaining today up here in Canada, in the Amazon, and then in Russia. Uh, but most forests have been heavily just deforested as a result of primarily agriculture. The big products that are responsible for most deforestation are beef. Uh, cattle not only need a lot of land to graze on, um, but even for cattle who are on feedlots, you know, those, they still need a lot of land for soy production that's fed to them. Uh, palm oil is also a huge driver of deforestation in Southeast Asia. And unfortunately with palm oil, not only does it result in deforestation, a lot of that deforestation occurs in peatlands, which actually release much more carbon than is released burning regular forests, um, burning trees. So palm oil, while a great ingredient in many ways, um, it's in you know, many, many products at this point in time, uh, it can have huge environmental impacts if it's not farmed sustainably. One of the third big drivers of deforestation is soy. As I mentioned with beef, soy is used to feed livestock and aquacultured fish. Um, less than 10% of the soy produced is actually consumed by humans. So most of that is going towards feeding livestock. And then lastly, the last big driver of deforestation is pulp and paper. And you may ask, what does it have to do with food? Um, well, when you are buying food in uh, cardboard boxes, you want to make sure that those cardboard boxes are certified uh, sustainably forested or they're made with recycled materials because pulp and paper um, can be huge drivers of deforestation. And I actually, I realized that I've been blowing through this and I had asked Helen to stop me with any questions. Um, so before I go on any further, are there any questions with uh, sort of the, the first couple slides in this presentation. So not yet. And I just want to encourage everybody to uh, put your questions into the chat for Annika. She'd love to hear from you. Obviously, she knows a lot about this topic and can answer them. Also, if you are watching us on YouTube, you have the option to also add your questions there. And so we, uh, we have an eye on that and we'll keep up with your questions. And um, Actually, I, if, you, if you don't mind, I just wanted to share an example of, uh, so this is some tea I found in my pantry and you can see that it has some of those certifications that you were talking about. So this one has two on there. And uh, then I found this. So I like to eat vegetables. So these are, this is like dried cauliflower. And oh, it has uh, also those, some of those same certifications and many, many others listed on here. Uh, and then lastly, something that you might not think about is I was looking at my yogurt. So my yogurt also had an organic certification. So you can see that there's a lot of these products that you use every day. And you can take another look at those and see if you want to, you know, substitute those with something that has one of these certifications uh, that Annika has mentioned. Yeah, thanks so much, Ellen. Rhythm actually would carry on Hive. So we're a huge fan of their company. They're a great, a great product.
So again, with deforestation, um, we're sorry that this, <laughs> this is such a, a sad topic. Uh, so a lot of us are questioning, why is this happening in the food system? A lot of it has to do with the demand for our product. As we mentioned on the previous slide, um, palm oil is in so many products from uh, sweets and chocolates to personal care items. Uh, soy can, is also used in many products, including in your meat. And so the, these, these products are, are fantastic because they have so many uses, but when there's a really, really high demand for them and there's not a lot of oversight into the production, um, the production can grow at a rapid rate and that can be unsustainable if forests are being cut down in order to grow these products. Um, they're also talking about organic certification and growing methods. Uh, the way these products are farmed makes a huge difference. Um, so palm, uh, palm oil, obviously, if it's grown on recently deforested peatlands, um, like we talked about, that can release a lot of uh, carbon into the atmosphere. Uh, soy is a genetically modified crop, which means that there can be a lot of chemical inputs associated with it, and it would be really important to specifically look for non-GMO soy products. Uh, as Helen mentioned with her organic yogurt, if you buy organic dairy and meat products, that means those animals were not fed genetically modified products. So those cows were not fed GMO soy, they were fed organic soy. And then as we talked about with uh, international agriculture, countries vary in their environmental re regulations. Some have better oversight than others. And that is where certifications do really come uh, into play and can be important tools for transparency. And it would be easier if we just didn't use these products, uh, some may think, but um, like I said, these products are important not only because of their uses, but they're also really culturally important. Um, so palm oil has been used for thousands of years um, in African uh, cuisine. And so it's important to recognize that, you know, these are natural products, these are good products. It's just, we would like them to be produced in more sustainable ways. All right, before we move on to carbon, are there any questions on ingredients and certifications? Nope, great. So the big one, carbon. Climate change is uh, definitely becoming more recognized as a, a, a phenomenon that is occurring. Um, I know that in Texas, uh, there was a, a big freeze a couple of weeks ago. And so um, it is going to be increasingly important for everyone across the board, um, governments, consumers, private industry to pay more attention to their carbon footprints and the emissions that they are putting out into the atmosphere. So just to give a quick overview of carbon sequestration, uh, broadly when we're talking about um, mitigating carbon footprints, we're talking about uh, carbon sequestration, removing carbon from the atmosphere and storing it in uh, vegetation and trees um, in the soil, in, in root systems, in the ocean. Uh, so taking it out of the atmosphere and putting it back into living things on earth. Um, and hopefully by promoting uh, projects that sequester more carbon, um, we are able to mitigate the emissions that just living produces. So it's really unavoidable to emit carbon uh, in, our, in our modern cities. Um, everything we do, every production, transportation, um, using our computers, all of that can contribute to carbon emissions. So one uh, really important tool that has become more popular is carbon offsetting. Um, with carbon offsetting projects, like we talked about, it, it can be related to planting trees, which will sequester carbon, but it's so much more than that. Um, carbon offsetting can be switching to more renewable sources of energy like solar, wind, or water. Um, it can be capturing 
methane gas from landfills, uh, meth methane is a huge greenhouse gas. And so by, by capturing that and using it as energy, um, uh, we're preventing that from being released into the atmosphere and contributing to climate change. Um, promoting better systems of livestock management, like regenerative agriculture that actually helps sequester more carbon into the soil. And then better managing uh, fires, making sure that forests aren't burned to pave way for new agriculture, um, things like that. So carbon offsetting has uh, a really wide array of applications. And the idea is that uh, when companies or individuals want to offset the emissions that they are producing, they are helping to fund these projects that wouldn't ordinarily take place. They would be additional projects um, that, that we all would be helping to promote. And then one of the other big issues, um, I think this slide is slightly out of order, so I apologize about that. Um, so one of, the, one of the other big issues that really has been at the forefront for a long time, but especially because of the, the COVID pandemic has become an even greater top of mind issue for people is uh, human rights abuses that are present in the food chain. So, Deforestation is not only an issue um, when it comes to producers who are trying to produce and, and pinch their pennies, look for the bottom line. Um, this can lead to human rights abuses such as using children as inexpensive labor or human trafficking uh, to provide free labor. So there are some particular supply chains that are especially risky. Uh, these, these tend to be less regulated supply chains um, with smaller farms where it's just more difficult to have oversight into them. Uh, chocolate, coffee, palm oil, seafood, tea, uh, nuts like cashews and hazelnuts. Um, not, not all of these products produced everywhere can have these issues. Uh, so we, we say that some of these projects have greater geographic risk. So for example, uh, chocolate in West Africa tends to have greater issues with human rights abuses and human trafficking than, than um, chocolate or cacao produced in Central and South America where it's native. And then on the flip side of that, palm oil produced in Southeast Asia tends to have uh, bigger issues with human rights abuses than palm oil produced in, in West Africa where, where that's native. Um, so when you're looking at products, uh, you can look for fair trade certified, certified slave free chocolate. If the chocolate or any of the ingredients come from an area that has high geographic risk, um, it doesn't mean that you should avoid it. It just means that you should ask the company what they're doing. Are they directly trading with farmers? Are they helping them transition to, to fair trade certified cooperatives? Um, that's why we, we work with companies like Equal Exchange and Tony's Chocolate Only because they're actually working in these areas where there are human rights abuses in agriculture and helping to uh, change the way that those products are produced. Any questions on carbon neutrality or issues in, in yes, supply chain? Yes, we do. Okay, Great. so for that, uh, do you know anything about any tax breaks that might be offered to companies who are participating with the carbon offset? Ooh, I am not the right person to ask that question to. Um, when it comes to uh, the operational business side, but um, I'm, I'm sure that there are. Um, I can definitely look into that. Into yeah, that, that is, and, a, and give that more is information a big on question. that. <laughs> All right, so we actually had, I'm, I apologize, I missed a question we had about your first section about certifications. And mm -hmm. that question is, are the certifications being regulated only by the United States and are there some international certifications? Yes, uh, fair trade is absolutely international. Um, there, there are branches that are based in the US but it is an international certification. Um, organic is also international. We have USDA organic, but there are a lot of other international organic certifying agencies. Um, so, and oftentimes their standards are 
can be higher, not necessarily for those two certifications, um, but many of the certifications that we have in the US are international as well, or have international branches. Well, that's fantastic. So no matter where you are, you know that you can be a conscious consumer. Yes. Uh, and, and so I, oh, okay, we got another question here. Um, or a comment, we have a comment, is the US farm conservation bills and reinstating some of those items to ensure that our farmers are encouraged to do conservation. So uh, you know, something else you can do is pay attention to legislation that's going on. And uh, you know, that's another way to have your voice be heard. Yes, absolutely. Um, the farm bill comes up every few years and you're absolutely right. There's um, incentives for farmers to set aside parts of their land for conservation. So, uh, and, and that that's as a result of, of um, people pushing to have those sorts of incentives put into the farm bill. So absolutely pay attention to legislation and, and public policy. All right, and then I just wanna add one last thing before you continue is that we understand that your time, everyone who joined us today, your time is valuable and we wanna say thank you. So uh, Green Dallas or uh, Office of Environmental Quality and Sustainability is offering a free thank you gift. Uh, all you need to do is send your name and mailing address to greendallas at dallascityhall.com. That's greendallas at dallascityhall.com. And you'll get a free gift. Uh, mention that you're here with this program with Hi, and we will get that out to you. And so that's available to anyone. So just uh, make sure you drop us that email. I also share that information in the chat. And um, I'm excited to hear what you're covering next, Annika. Well, this will be our, our last section. So thank you so much for sitting through and listening today. Uh, the last topic that we're going to touch on is packaging and uh, recycling, because those are, as you talked about in, in Helen in your first, in the first part of the presentation, um, we want to make sure that all packaging for food products and, and really all products ends up in the right places so that it doesn't run off into the ocean and become um, plastic waste in, in nature. So as many of you are probably aware, uh, the US used to ship most of our recycling to Asia. Um, in the last couple of years, uh, China has, has since put greater restrictions on what we can send. So they only take the cleanest recycling. And so now the US is having to grapple with our massive amount of waste, particularly plastic waste. Um, so one of the things that, that we do at Hive is, is really make sure that all of the products that come onto our site can be generally easily recycled. Um, a couple of those products that are widely recyclable, glass, metal, um, plastics one and two. So, you know, your, your rigid plastic bottles and milk jugs, um, uh, paper, cardboard, and then, you know, your, your mixed papers. So kind of across the board, those are the types of packaging you should look for. Obviously, many products come in packaging that isn't that, uh, like flexible film plastics, everyone loves chips and candy wrappers, um, but there are a few ways to prevent those from becoming waste. So I just wanted to point out that uh, recycling is a private industry currently, so that's why it does vary from county to county within the U.S. There's no national recycling policy, um, and because it is a private industry, it, it does it, it costs cities quite a bit of money. Um, so, if I know Dallas has a, a really great recycling program, um, but that's not the case in all cities. Uh, so, hopefully, within the next couple of years or the next few years, um, recycling will become a bigger issue to institute nationally. But until then, we are doing what we can to reduce plastic waste and other waste out into the environment um, by trying to recycle as, as much as we can. And, and some packaging types are infinitely recyclable. Um, metals, glass, those, are, those can be recycled multiple times. Plastic, not so much, but there are um, industries that will take lower grade recycled plastic and turn it into things like park benches, um, playground uh, equipment. And so, yeah, before we move on, just wanted to point out that 
one of the things that we do at Hive to, to help facilitate moving the plastic that's not commonly recyclable in your curbside container to things like turning them into park benches and, and, and some of the other ways that we can keep plastic out of the environment is by partnering with an organization called TerraCycle. Um, so when you shop on Hive and you know you get your, your chips and your candy wrappers because we do, we do sell regeneratively grown potato chips on Hive, um, you can also opt in to getting a prepaid TerraCycle envelope with your order. You can put all of the plastic packaging that you can't recycle curbside into that envelope, seal it up, drop it in the mailbox, box, send it back to TerraCycle, and they will turn it into, uh, they will recycle all of it and, and turn it into um, some of those things that I mentioned, like uh, playground equipment. And then what happens to all of the waste that can't get recycled? Um, just briefly to touch on landfills. Uh, most landfills are what are known as dry tombs. And so everything that ends up there just does not decompose organic, compostable, plastic, doesn't matter. It's gonna stay that way for a very long time. Uh, there's another type of, type of landfill called um, bioreactor landfills. And when we talked about carbon offsets earlier, these bioreactor landfills uh, actually speed up the decomposition process and release methane gas and that can be then be used for energy. Um, so both of these landfills have uh, their positives and negatives. Um, and it really depends on your city, what the, where they get their energy from, if they have the land to have the traditional dry tomb landfills. Um, I'm personally, I'm in New York City where we do not have that land. So it's incredibly important for us to have like a really robust recycling infrastructure. Um, but places like Texas, you have a lot more land, so it's okay to have larger landfills, but it's still not ideal. And then Helen had mentioned to me earlier that um, the city of Dallas will hopefully be instituting an organics recycling program or composting program. So I just wanted to touch on uh, the difference between compostable and biodegradable materials. Um, compostable materials are the ideal when it comes to being able to break something down and have it really leave no impact on the environment. Um, things can be industrially compostable, which is what something like the city would help you with, or some things are even compostable in your own backyard. Uh, biodegradable materials um, do break down, but they may leave additional toxins or residues. So you wanna make sure that if you have packaging that is biodegradable, it is also compostable uh, so that it's not leaving any, any toxins. So, this little graphic over here shows everything that's compostable is biodegradable, but not everything that's biodegradable is, is truly compostable, which is the most, most environmentally friendly. And that is everything that I have today. I know that was a lot of information. So please, if you have any questions at all, feel free to ask. If I can't answer them, I'd be happy to point you in the direction of someone who can. Helen, do we have any? Any questions? Uh, well, not quite yet. And we are hoping that we will get some soon. So everybody, please add your questions into the chat. Now, uh, we, uh, I am excited that you brought up the uh, bioreactor landfill because here in the city of Dallas, we do have a bioreactor landfill. It actually does produce methane gas and that gas is captured. It is cleaned and it is sold as natural gas on the open market. Now, I am not encouraging everyone to throw everything away. Uh, we still want you to recycle. We still want you to compost. We still want you to, to live a zero waste lifestyle. Uh, but as we all know, landfills only have so much life left in them. And the fact that we can actually uh, get some of those organics into the landfill and have them turn into energy is a benefit uh, to us and the city of Dallas. But please still uh, recycle and uh, you know, reduce your waste and compost. That helps us even more. And also we had a comment uh, that the city of Dallas has a materials recycling facility at our landfill. And that is called a MRF for materials recycling facility. And it's managed by a company called FCC Environmental. So what, what happens is in Dallas, as, as a lot of you guys know, you put all of your recyclables into one bin. You don't have to separate them. So that is called single stream. 
And then so all of that, uh, all those recyclables are taken to the FCC facility and they're poured out basically, and they're sorted by machinery and a little bit by people. And they're separated and they're bailed. And then they are sold on the uh, market, just like Annika was saying that recycling is a business here in the United States. And we are so excited to share that the city of Dallas sells all of our recyclables locally, except something, uh, there's something that does go to Canada. So all of our recyclables here in the city of Dallas are recycled. They are not uh, taken anywhere else. So they are sold locally, usually within uh, Texas, Louisiana, but something does go to Canada. Now, something else to that will help keep our recyclables in the United States is to make sure that you're recyclable, you're recycling exactly the right thing. So we like to say recycle right, because when you put something in there that doesn't belong, it can cause contamination, which basically means that entire load has to go into the trash and it cannot be recycled because it's been contaminated with other things. So for example, motor oil comes in a plastic bottle. The plastic bottle is recyclable, but there's still motor oil left inside. So that motor oil could leak out and contaminate paper and cardboard and all these other things. And then all of that has to be thrown away. So uh, just make sure that you're recycling the right things. Um, probably one of the biggest things is the pizza box, right? So everybody, I want you to put in the chat, can a pizza box be recycled? This is probably one of the biggest questions. This is probably the most frequent on the FAQs. Number one is gonna be the pizza box. Are pizza boxes recyclable? All right, I'm gonna give it just a little bit more time. We, we have a couple, we have three, uh, three responses so far. All right, okay, so I am excited. We have some really good uh, recycling aware uh, people here. And uh, so the pizza box is only recyclable if it's, not, if it's not greasy or covered in cheese and all sorts of gooey, wonderful pizza mess. So a good rule of thumb is the lid is usually clean. So you can tear off the lid and recycle the lid, but the bottom part that, that might have grease or cheese or anything like that, that part uh, needs to go into the trash. So the pizza box was a trick question and everybody got it right. So yes, we had a yes and no was one of the answers and that is absolutely correct uh, when it comes to pizza boxes. So the same thing with uh, different kinds of food containers. Um, like uh, let's say you have an aluminum can that had a beverage in it. Just give it a quick rinse, put a little bit of water in there, swish it around, pour that water out, maybe pour it in a house plant, depending on what was in your container. And um, that will be perfect for our curbside recycling. All right, and then we actually do have uh, some more questions. So um, Annika, are Hive brands only available online? That is a great question. Uh, Hive itself is only available online. Many of the brands can be found in your local grocery stores. Um, a lot of, we have a couple brands uh, from Texas, as you saw, Rhythm Foods, uh, Humble House Sauces. So you can find the brands around the country, but yes, Hive Brands is purely an online grocery store. And we've been up and running for about six months and we would love to see you on there. Uh, do you want to share that on the screen? Do you want to pull up the Hive Brands website? Sure. All right, and then while you're doing that, we have another question is, are there any certain buzzwords on labels that cover up ingredients that they may not want us to see? So for example, <laughs> so of course, work from home, I have <laughs> knocking on my door. Absolutely, hold on just a second. Uh, I can answer for some some buzzwords. Um, a lot of times that comes up with uh, animal welfare. I've found so if you if you see things like um, cage free or naturally raised, those don't always mean a lot. You want to look for uh, certifications when it comes to that. Um, certified grass fed, certified humanely raised. Uh, so you do want to dig a little bit deeper into some of those buzzwords and make sure that. Um, the the products or the uh, livestock was actually raised in the way that you think they were. Um, some other, like I said, naturally raised. Naturals is a big one. Green, um, ethical. 
that those are all great descriptors, but you just wanna make sure that the claims are actually backed up. Absolutely. Does that answer your question? I believe so. And um, what are uh, what are some of your favorite products that you can find on Hive? Ooh, also a great question. Uh, one of my absolute favorite brands. So, so just to point out what we have, we have pantry items, snacks, beverages, personal care, uh, household cleaning supplies. So we have a, a wide range of products. One of my absolute favorite brands though is Alter Eco uh, because they, they meet every single one of our criteria for sustainability. Uh, we have what's known as the Hive Five. So we look for um, brands that have really good sourcing and ingredient integrity, uh, brands that are paying attention to their carbon footprints um, and, and offsetting them if necessary. We're looking for brands that have recyclable packaging uh, we're looking to see if brands give back to their communities. And then the fifth of the high five is we want brands that, you know, they taste really good. They're, uh, they're something that you actually really enjoy eating. So I'll pull up Alter Eco. And I really love them because they meet every single one of our standards with flying colors, um, particularly their truffle products. Um, so I mentioned that candy wrappers are one thing that's often really difficult to recycle. Uh, Alter Eco's truffles are wrapped in compostable candy wrappers. Uh, so they have excellent source sourcing. They work directly with cocoa farmers, um, uh, uh, cocoa farming cooperatives. Uh, in terms of their carbon footprint, they not only offset their carbon footprint, they actually um, help their farmers uh, uh, develop better agroforestry ecosystems on their farms. So they're, they're, they're making sure that their cocoa plantations are uh, full of trees and wildlife um, through a process. It's not carbon offsetting, it's called carbon insetting because they're actually uh, planting these trees within their own supply chain. And then they have the compostable wrappers. So their packaging is 100% uh, recyclable or compostable. Um, they, they give back to a variety of causes uh, and then they just, they taste absolutely amazing. So yes, thank you for asking me that because highly recommend uh, these truffles as well as really most things on our site. You, you know, uh, I had some fair trade chocolate uh, and I wanted to show that, you know, when I was showing some of the, 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 the certifications and stuff like that on products, but I realized I ate it all. So I can... <laughs> Because, and, and, you know, it's, it's wonderful when you can enjoy something that's maybe a little special or a treat or decadent, and you know that you're helping others, you're giving back, and you're making the world a better place. So that just means I'm going to eat more chocolate. Yes, absolutely. And in, in, uh, just in, because all of our products are online, um, when you shop through us, every single order is automatically carbon offset. You don't even have to opt in. We just, we take care of um, the offset projects and we choose offset projects based on the location where the orders are coming in from. So if you live in Texas, I think our closest offset project is in California. So you're helping support uh, reforestation and sustainable forest management in California. Oh, that's fantastic. That's wonderful to know because uh, sometimes uh, you don't know whether it's it's greener to shop online or maybe to, you know, shop in person or something like that. So the fact that I know that uh, I, that I have this, in, this offset or inset uh, uh, that that's helping with that, uh, that's wonderful. And could you talk a little bit more about, uh, so how Hive works? It, like, it's it, like, is it a, a service or is it just a place where you shop? And also a little bit more about uh, where you get your products. Like, how do you find all of these wonderful companies? We have a wonderful merchandising team um, that they've worked in the food industry for, for many decades. Uh, so they are aware of a lot of the more established independent companies. We only work with independently owned, com independently owned companies. Um, they work with a lot of uh, established companies, but also sort of the up and coming companies. Um, so we, uh, it's really sort of word of mouth and, and looking and seeing who's really excelling in the packaging space. 
uh, who's excelling with zero waste production practices, who's really um, doing a great job with responsible sourcing and supply chains that are risky. So, so it's very specific to each category. And we really look at, you know, who are the best companies in each category for these particular products, um, knowing full well that for some categories, it's just easier to have higher standards than others. Like, you know, chips are just one of those things where chips are still in plastic bags. And so we look for, uh, you know, who's doing the best farming practices, who is, uh, you, you know, paying their farmers fairly, um, practicing regenerative ag agriculture, things like that. And then, sorry, I think I, I think I missed the first part of that question. Uh, no, absolutely. Thank you for sharing that information because, you know, that takes a lot of the guesswork or research out for, for like me or anyone else that wants to be that conscious consumer that we can go to a place that you've done all of that work for us. Um, the other thing would be a little bit like, how, how does Hive work? Is it like a service? Is it like a subscription base or, or how does it work? There's no, it's not a subscription model at all. Um, it's just like any other online marketplace where you can go, you can choose the products you want, uh, put them in your basket, check out. It can be a one-time thing. We'd love if you came back and purchased uh, on a regular basis, but no subscription necessary. We're not gonna try to send you you know, a $200 order twice in a row. Um, so yeah, it's really, it's, it, we're, we're looking to be a grocery store, but be accessible, be carbon neutral, provide a way for customers to recycle their packaging. And then, like you said, take a lot of the guesswork out of uh, the products that we carry. And we, we may have a brick and mortar store in the future, but we did launch during the pandemic. And as it turned out, online grocery shopping um, is definitely, I mean, it, it is really important for people to be able to shop online if needed. Absolutely. I, I think everybody has had the increase of cardboard boxes on their porch uh, <laughs> during the last year. And um, all right. Uh, one last question. So you mentioned that you'd like to expand to a retail store, but are you going to be expanding any of the items that you offer on your website? Yes, we are looking to expand into fresh and frozen items. Um, there are a lot of sustainability considerations when it comes to that. Um, so we are looking into, yeah, potentially offering fresh and, and frozen products in the future. Do you think any of those would be pre-made meals? Hopefully. I can't say too much about it, but hopefully. All right. Well, we understand that, that uh, businesses have their, uh, you, you know, you, you, ha you have your plans and your strategies and everything like that. Um, okay. I think we just got one more question that popped in is um, you mentioned about how uh, you can send back your plastic film, like your plastic wraps and different things like that, that goes to TerraCycle. Um, mm -hmm. Can you send back any other, like the other empty products uh, for recycling? Is that an option you offer? Yes. So any, any small pieces of plastic, uh, you talked about contamination earlier, um, really small pieces of plastic tend to be contaminants. Uh, they usually end up in the glass recycling stream. And so plastic caps, um, plastic little shrink bands, um, little tiny plastic bottles, all of that can be thrown into the bag and, and sent back and therefore it's recycled as opposed to being thrown away. That's fantastic. And also just to let uh, people in the Dallas area know that uh, plastic film is not acceptable in your curbside recycling because of the machinery that is used to sort your recyclables. It actually can uh, tangle in the sorting equipment, all the little gears and conveyors and different things like that. Uh, so please keep your plastic film, bubble wrap, and styrofoam out of your blue bin. There are certain places that you can drop some of those materials off uh, for recycling. A lot of different uh, brick and mortar retail locations have plastic film recycling available, usually near the front door, where you can take your plastic bags and plastic film, and they usually accept bubble wrap also, um, and you can recycle those there. And then a styrofoam, there are a, just a, a few places where you can drop that off, but often, not always, Often styrofoam is contaminated with food waste. Uh, a lot of times that's how you get a lot of your styrofoam. 
Uh, and so that needs to go into the trash. And then of course, if you have styrofoam packaging material, uh, if possible, you can reuse that when you mail something. And, um, and then lastly, we had a comment about placing lids from plastic bottles back on. Yes, so if you have a, uh, this is a, not a rude example, if you have a plastic uh, water bottle or, or uh, something like that, or soda, whatever it is you're enjoying, if you put your plastic cap back onto the bottle, drop that into your curbside recycling here in Dallas, then that does get recycled. But Annika does bring up a good, good point that a lot of those small pieces fall through the equipment. They fall off the conveyor belts or fall through screens and different things like that end up on the floor. And then since it's mixed up with all, all sorts of little other items, all of that is swept up and has to be thrown away. So yes, if you are recycling your plastic caps with the city of Dallas, please screw those back onto the bottle. Or if you're getting them from Hive, mail them back in that uh, prepaid envelope there so they can be recycled by TerraCycle. So I, uh, I think this was a wonderful and informative and eye-opening uh, presentation. Thank you so much, Annika, for being here with us and sharing Hive and congratulations for successfully launching a business during a pandemic. Thank you so much, Helen. We really appreciate it. And uh, you know, our goal is to really push for better food systems. So we, we hope that you've been able to take away um, enough, this is some knowledge, some new information to really support better food systems all around. Absolutely, we can all do a part and, and uh, it's just the, maybe just changing our mindset, just tweaking it just a little tiny bit and making these small changes that add up to big benefits for everyone. Uh, you're getting a ton of virtual high fives and wonderful uh, kudos for your presentation. So thank you so much. And um, just a reminder that if you pre-register for this, you will be getting an email from the Dallas Public Library in a few days that will have a little bit more additional information and a survey that you can take uh, to help us create better programming. Also, this presentation will remain on the Dallas Public Library's YouTube page under playlist, Dallas Environmental Quality and Sustainability, so that you can reference it again, you can share it with uh, friends and family, and, uh, and it's always there for you, just like a real library. So on behalf of the Dallas Public Library, Dallas Office of Environmental Quality and Sustainability, and uh, Annika, thank you so much for joining us. Don't forget to send your email, I mean, your mailing address and name to greendallas at dallascityhall.com to get your free thank you gift for joining us today. And everyone, thank you and please stay safe. Thank you so much. Thank you.